Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for coming to our weekly AMA. This week, it's with the Pangolin team. We've got myself, Leo. We've got Justin, our project manager. We've got Brandon, our lead developer. You guys want to say hey? Hey, hey all. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> You're enjoying your coffee or tea. All right. Well, let's um, let's just kind of recap what's been going on in the Pangolin world a bit, and then we'll take some questions. So, um, you know, right now on our radar, we've just announced a couple partnerships. Very excited. Um, we're doing some snapshot voting for new pairs. We've got BMB. We've got Beefy. Also exciting. We've got a new bridge coming, um, AB bridge that we're excited to see and support. Uh, what am I missing here, Brandon and, and Justin? What other updates do we have before we jump into questions? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of like kind of financial stuff that we, we, we've pushed through, uh, you know, there's a, yeah, the whole heap of stuff. Um, but I, I, I guess maybe we let the community decide what they would like to focus on. We're also right at the end of the localization event. Uh, that's kind of a few, a few things getting out the way. In fact, to go live after we pay people for their contributions. Yeah. Yeah. That should be huge. We do have a international community and we want to support that. So cool. Let's jump into some questions. So this one was posted by HK yesterday, actually. So some questions for the AMA. What's the current status of the UX redesign? When do you think it's going to be launched? Who wants to take this one? Um, I'll jump in. Um, so I mean, so so basically, there's a few parts to the UX UI redesign. Um, so there's the branding, which is you know the logo, the color palettes. Um, the kind of tone of voice that we want to approach. So there's those types of things, and then there's the actual design. Um, so in regard to the design, um, really we want to do some A/B testing. Uh, so what A/B testing is is a, you know you you open it up to a, a bunch of researchers or uh, early adopters, and you give them two separate designs. Um, you then uh, watch how they interact with the application. Um, so, for example, you can use heat maps to see how people's mouse uh, navigates through the, 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 the platform, and then you then interview them afterwards. So, what did you like? What didn't you like? And then you incorporate that feedback into the next phase of that design. Um, so, that's the way that a, a, in, you know, a UX professional agency, how they normally go about designing applications, uh, and we'd like to follow that approach. Um, so that means it's going to take slightly longer uh, than if we just kind of, you know, did a redesign and pushed it out without getting any feedback. So um, I don't think we have any uh, exact timelines, um, but currently we've got what they call low fidelity prototypes. Or so what a low fidelity prototype is is it's a, a prototype that you can interact with, but it doesn't have any color, it doesn't have any branding, so it doesn't distract the early testers. Um, so often in software testing, people go, oh, I don't like this color, oh, I don't like this. And the point of a low fidelity uh, prototype is not to focus on those types of things, it's to focus on the user flow of the application. Um, so those are up and ready. Um, we're busy pushing through um, some differences into the A-B testing and we're testing those internally. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully once those are up and running, we should have much better uh, uh, um, yeah, we should know a lot more about when those should be live. Awesome. Thanks for that update. Uh, okay. And then the second question from the same user is about Avalanche subnets. So the question is, uh, makes, uh, someone said it would make sense to have a Pangolin subnet in the future. Can you enlighten us about this topic? What benefits would it bring to Pangolin and the ecosystem? Is it worthy to be one of the first subnets? What do you guys think? Brandon, you want that one? Do I want that one? I kind of love that. If you want to take it? You want to take it? Yeah, sure. I think subnets uh, and probably the the technology there is more up your uh, set of interests than mine. Uh, I got most of my focus on Pangolin as the the C chain existence and what we can do okay. and kind of the the borders we can push there. Okay, cool. So I've actually, I, I've been struggling to sleep with subnets that I've decided on. And, 
um like <laughs> like honestly like it's made like submaps for me open up so many cool design um ideas like it's just amazing um so i think there's i think there's definitely benefit in being one of the first um but i don't think that's the the the, the thing we should be focusing on like i think there was like if you look at in wyoming there was the the first dow in wyoming and it was some like obscure little dow that no one really cares about so if we can be the first subnet, that would be awesome. But I'd rather be the best subnet than the first. Um, so if we talk about design decisions, wow, you can do so much cool stuff, right? So so currently with um, the subnet, you can have what they call um, the Avalanche Virtual Machine, um, and then you can have the uh, EVM, which is you know the Ethereum Virtual Machine. But now you can do custom uh, VMs. So I think, you know, I really like Avalanche's uh, approach. They've got the P chain, which is your platform chain. So if we if we were going to do a subnet, we would have to focus first on our version of the P chain. So let's talk a bit about what that would need to do. So that P chain, um, I don't know what we want to call ours, like the Pangolin home base or whatever you want to call it, right? That would have to focus on a few cool things. So first of all, it would have to uh, encourage people to validate. So like, why would you validate Pangolin subnet as a validator? You, you kind of got to incentivize these people. So currently there's about a thousand validators um, on Avalanche, right? So you'd want them to validate the Pangolin subnet and you'd want to give them some form of rewards. I've got an idea on how to do those rewards, um, but that's quite a competitive um, space. So I don't want to release too much information there because I think someone may um yeah but basically we need to incentivize them and then we also need some form of identity so what kind of concerns me about the current avalanche is if you go to the x chain you've got one address and you go to the c chain you've got another address so like your identity or your wallet is split up between the chains and i don't really dig that like i, I like from a user experience point of view i think that's quite that's not great so like if you go onto the Pangolin home base chain, if you will, you should have an ability to get an address that is then consistent across all of the blockchains in that subnet. So what a lot of people don't understand or people I've spoken to is they think a subnet's just one chain, but no, a subnet is actually a collection of blockchains. So we could have a Pangolin subnet, which would have our home base, which then uh, does the stake in, gives you your identity, but then in there, you could go to the blockchain Australia, as an example, and you could interact with Australian companies um, that are regulatory compliant. But then you could go to like, you know, like a Sherpa blockchain, which is completely uh, anonymous, right? So everything is controlled by ZK Snarks or Stocks. Um, so like nothing gets seen outside of that. It's all encrypted. And then you could jump across to like a European or an American uh, blockchain, but they're all within the Pangolin subnet. Um, and there's a lot of ways to create revenue within that, like a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm super excited about subnets. Like it's like the design space is just incredible. Yeah, that was a great and thorough answer. And I, I typed out most of the notes there. Uh, yeah, it sounds very powerful. I think it's one of it's one of the attractions of that Avalanche network is they have subnets, whereas other chains don't. So thanks for the answer and good question. So we got a comment from MF. Um, seems quite intensive to gather feedback for LoFi. Why not just push out LoFi concepts and gather feedback from that to push front runners into HiFi and then do a-B testing or MVT for one to three key designs. So this is about the UX redesign. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point. Um, I mean, the low part concept, we're not doing broad testing, right? So we're doing testing internally within the team. Um, so for example, like, you know, the currently we're looking at the swap page um, and like um, on the, like we were just finalizing our integration with Wire uh, at the moment, right? So. So there'll be an ability uh, to, to go into Pangolin with your credit card or whatever and purchase directly, right, with Fiat. Um, so now one of the designs has like a separate button for bar and then a separate button for swap. And then my feedback was like, well, what happens if you just kind of like abstract that 
um, and, and, and people don't even know, right? But like if you choose a fiat currency like USD, then at that point it pops up a mode or that says enter your credit card details. So it is quite intensive, I agree, um, if, if we broaden the uh, audience. But currently in our low fire, it's just me, Leo and Brandon and Abdullah that are, are actually doing uh, the testing and the feedback loop. Um, but I agree, once it then goes, also what's happening is Abdullah is doing the, the, the flow and then Metafox is doing the logo um, and then the color. So I, I don't know if you guys know Metafox. Metafox did all of the Sherpa stuff. So if you look at Sherpa's website, Metafox did that. She did the logo for, Meta, uh, for Sherpa. She also did the logo and all of the work for Kudu. And it, it makes sense to do this kind of different ABs with different parts of the redesign. So for something more granular like that, the AB makes more sense um, at a deeper level. But something like the logo might not make sense. Um, so if we've got multiple things that have kind of been fleshed out, you could just put those out there in a, in a poll of sorts on Telegram that might be more efficient. Awesome. Good question and, and good answer. Let's just take some notes here. Yeah, so, you know, UX, um, you know, it's a process. There are best practices and techniques to do. And I think we'll just need to figure out uh, what would work best for us in our development process. Good question. Okay, what else does the uh, audience want to know about the team, about Pangolin, our roadmap, what we're focused on? The ecosystem got some cool things coming. We're excited about Banky and lending and Chainlink coming. Uh, it's going to be a game changer to finally have oracles. And just can't uh, emphasize enough how good this new bridge is going to be. You know, everyone's kind of struggling with AEB. I know every time I use it, I'm a little worried that it's not going to work. So new bridge will be great. Okay, so here's a good question. Uh, on the about the on ramp directly into the app, will it require doing KYC or know your customer? Who knows the answer to this one? Yeah, so I think um, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, it does require KYC. So, so we use in wire. So, there's actually quite a few different um, fiat on ramps we can use. There's wire. There's uh, transact. Uh, we chose Wire because they offer um, a broader uh, set of currencies um, and they're a bit more established. Um, so Wire offers a few different ways you can uh, use it within your applications. Um, you can white label it. So what white label means is, you know, you can put your own design elements in it. Um, so it looks like yours, but it still uses their um, software. Um, but we're beholden to uh, Wire. And why it does require KYC? Uh, sorry, not KYC. Um, it requires you to put your name in, right? So it's it's not going to ask you for your driver's license, as an example. It's your credit card. Um, so like you know what, it, like the same thing as when you go to eBay or when you go to Amazon, right? It, it asks you for details about you, um, but it doesn't ask you to upload your passport, as an example. So I think wire. If you want the direct answer, I believe Wire allows you to, to on-ramp uh, $500 USD or less per seven days uh, without going through its more detailed KYC process. Um, and I've done that. You can do that with just, uh, I think, a credit card and uh, an address. It'll do like a sample, like couple cent transaction to verify the card. Um, I'm less familiar, kind of like Hargis kind of talking about, with the bigger numbers in a shorter period of time from Wire. Um, but I think they do have some sort of KYC in process just to stay compliant. And of course, we, we would inherit that using them as a the on ramp provider. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you nailed it, Brandon. There's limits to how much you can actually use a week or how much you can actually spend on it. Um, so uh, if we wanted to attract institutional investors, then wire wouldn't be the mechanism to get their money in. Um, so what I mean by that is, let's say, for example, you had a whale that wanted to put in like $100,000, um, you know, wire wouldn't be the mechanism uh, we'd use. Um, we don't want to exclude those people, definitely not. Uh, 
Uh, so if we want to attract those types of uh, users, uh, then, then we're going to have to use a different mechanism to get that money in. And it, it's also noted too, like if you do one of these fiat on ramps through Pangolin, you're not excluded from using that anywhere else in the ecosystem. Uh, we're not locking any of this to Pangolin or something insane like that. So if you were to, you know, spend US dollars or euros for, I think in this case it would be Avox, you could then swap that right on Pangolin and use it wherever you want in whatever assets you want. It, 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 exactly, Brandon nailed it. And, and the cool thing is all the work that, <clears throat> excuse me, all the work that we've done. So, so, so actually currently there's a bit of a bug um, in the wire integration to the C chain um, that, that we're working with the wire team to resolve. But once that's resolved, any project can do that. So like any project can use a uh, wire within their dApps uh, with the C chain integration. Um, so like, you know, like it, it benefits the entire ecosystem having this integration piece. Yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. And, you know, it's really exciting because one of the challenges on the Avalanche network is just getting funds here in the first place. And these direct fiat on ramps are gonna help adoption, can help current users. Uh, it's gonna be great. Cool, thanks for that discussion and that question. So the next one's from Zero Cool. Will the PNG token get listed on other centralized exchanges like Qcoin? Um, yeah, Justin, you wanna talk about this one? Yeah, look, definitely. We, we learned some lessons yet. And I think, um, you know, that's, you know, one of the cool things and hard things sometimes of uh, a community owned project is you learn your lessons in public. Um, and we, in, in my mind, I learned a few things from the gate listing. Um, you, 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 you know, there's ways that these things should occur. Um, and, and I don't think we, we did it as well as we should have. Um, so we will list on KuCoin. So let's talk about why we haven't listed KuCoin yet. Um, so we've, we've, we've actually spoken to KuCoin. We've actually spoken to exchanges that are in um, the top five on uh, CoinGecko, which I'm not allowed talking about yet, but though we, we, we're having those dis discussions. Um, the reason we haven't pulled the flag or the pin and we've actually uh, gone live on them yet is because the bigger exchanges require a legal entity um so we are now forming a legal entity which we're just actually i've just submitted all my documentation uh two days ago to form that legal entity and the other thing these major exchanges need is a market maker um so what a market maker does is they keep the spread and they keep your asset liquid um so what that means is they're actually constantly buying and selling your token on your behalf to make sure that the volume and the spread is um working um, they, they do a whole bunch of advanced trading strategies. So what these market makers do is they say, cool, we'll act on your behalf uh, on these exchanges. They work on both uh, centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges. Um, and then what they do is you then give them money, your token, so however many PNG, and then they trade on your behalf. So they make sure that your token is liquid. There's a whole bunch of benefits that they provide. Um, we didn't do that on gate. Um, and, and, and I believe that was a, a mistake on our part. Uh, I don't want to make that same mistake with KuCoin. Um, so I've actually spoken to three separate um, market makers. Uh, so one focuses primarily on DEXs. Uh, this one, uh, they won like the Binance, they designed the Binance API. Um, it's very good. I've, I've spoken to another one that focuses more on like sexes. And then I focuses, and then I've spoken to the one that we're ultimately going to use, which is slightly more expensive, but um, they're like, you know, very very good at what they do. Um, so a, again, I'd encourage any any um, tokens or projects within the ecosystem if they'd like to speak to me, I can give them contact details for all of that. So what I normally say is, if you're only going to list your token on a dex. Um, let me know. There, there, there's a guy that uh, he focuses primarily on becoming a market maker for DEXs. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's been an interesting journey. Um, and as soon as the legal entity is set up, we then have to then formally sign a legal agreement with this market maker. We then have to transfer the money from our treasury, what they call working capital, to them. And it's at that point that we'll list that coupon. And 
<laughs> and potentially a few others which I can't mention just yet, but there's some cool stuff. But yeah, there's some very cool ones coming. Awesome. Thanks for that insight. And thanks for, you know, just being so transparent about this process with your governance posts and just, you know, giving the community as much information as possible to understand this process. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, we, we do want to list on Keycoin and other exchanges. There are some prerequisites that we need to get right to make it as effective of a listing as possible. So good question and good answer. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the next one is from Coralp. Will there be any IDO planning to come out anytime soon? What do you guys think? Um, I mean, do, I guess I'd ask, do you mean will Pangolin do like an IDO, like a launch pad? Or are you talking about a partnership with launch pads? Um, I, I, I just, because, the thing is, you know, there's quite a lot of launch pads within the ecosystem now. You know, there's, you know, obviously Snowball, uh, sorry, there's obviously Penguin, there's obviously Avalanche. Um, I think uh, AnySwap, I think they've got one too that supports Avalanche. So are you talking about us releasing that? Or because what I see us more is providing an on ramp for that. Oh, okay. So, okay, cool. So you just explained a stake in and whitelist in. I mean, Staken is, um, you know, different. Like, I don't really know what you mean by whitelisting. Is that like, do you mean like KYC and stuff? So that like you have to register, like, for example, on Avalanche release their KYC. Um, yeah, I think, I think he's talking about like the Avalanche model where you stake the Zaba token and then you're whitelisted uh, for a share. And I, you know, I don't think that Penguin, it's on Penguin's roadmap to get into the launchpad space. You know, just because there are such strong partners in the space already, uh, we just partnered with Pools or a cross-chain launchpad. Uh, Avalanche is very close to us. You know, Mark, the director, is on our multi-sig wallet as a signer. Um, so we'd love to support any projects that want to do ideas with, you know, marketing and helping them get their pairs added and potentially rewarded. But as for building out the contracts and adding that into our app, uh, we feel like it's better to recommend the, you know, the projects that specialize in this. Did you say that's an accurate answer, Justin and Brandon? Yeah, nailed it. Yes, sir. Cool. Good question. Okay. So hopefully that answered your question. The next one is from George. Uh, does Eamon have connections with the team, and does he consider pangolin as the main avalanche decks oh interesting question what do you guys think yeah raise your hand um, if you've had a call with gun uh i'm basically raising my hand I, I've <laughs> <to gun. laughs> um yeah I, I i mentioned this probably a few months ago and i was accused of uh some ugly things but but i have spoken i have spoken to gun uh, i've also got like a signal group um with him and Kevin, um, and I've spoken to Kevin obviously uh, a few times. Um, uh, well, I mean, it, so, so, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for good, right? Um, like, I don't like he, he he's involved in so many things. Um, like, I mean, and, and I guess it also, yeah. So, I mean, currently it's definitely the main what like Avalanche decks, but they they're obviously looking. At a whole bunch of other kind of new types of things. So, you know, like Pangolin's an automated market maker, right? Um, using like an like a, a very well defined formula. But you know, they they're, they're working on things that will hopefully shake that space up. Um, so new types of financial primitives um, that, that that potentially haven't been seen before. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's a it's a it's, there's a lot of broad question like i mean pangolin definitely is a foundational piece of the avalanche network that will you know integrate and play within that ecosystem but there are going to be other financial primitives that they're going to release 100 percent yeah good good question you know i think um 
you know, the leaders at Avalanche, you know, they, they lean on the big projects and the ecosystem to help drive the vision forward, right? It's a mutual um, relationship, for example, uh, with the new bridge they're building, the Avery Bridge, you know, Pangolin's going to be a huge uh, player in ease in helping that transition for sure. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to have close connections with the people building and leading the network too, right? What do you think, Brandon? I, I'd second that. Um, I think with a, a big bulk of the current liquidity in Pangolin right now, um, that kind of puts us in a place where we're maybe responsible for more things than some other projects might be. We kind of that, that weight might fall on our shoulders. Um, so as far as Goon goes, he's got, as Justin mentioned, like big, uh, big ducks to be shooting at. You know, if you go through anything he's saying in, in a public forum, it's much more interested at the broader state of finance and how blockchain and avalanche can attack kind of those different needs uh, more broadly. So Peglin's out here right now in the, the decentralized finance space. So that's just one kind of facet of, I think, what he's interested in. Yeah, yeah, that's a good perspective. Um, you know, I think I think they have an interesting perspective that, you know, like Brandon said, DeFi is one piece of the pie, but TradFi, traditional finance, is another huge piece of the pie that they have their eye on. So, you know, when we talk in our Pangolin forums, we're all talking about DeFi, but there's a whole other world out there in the traditional space that's, you know, trying to get into DeFi as well. So exciting stuff. Okay, so let's take another question from George. Who is the main person behind the project? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, I want... love this question. You want to take this one, Brandon? This is a fun one. Yeah, usually you could just look at a you know a statement or a an incorporation document. And there'd be a name there, um, but Penguin's got quite its own unique story of where it came from and kind of the the diverse set of roots it's got. So some people might come out there and say, oh, it was, uh, you know, Ava Labs who kind of started the ball rolling. They needed a DEX for, for market making and, and price discovery. So Ava discovered that. They, they started it. And that's like, you know, that's too broad. So people would say, oh, maybe it was one of the, the devs who kind of shouldered the initial responsibility for the technical lift. You know, oh, it was Connor who did it. So definitely Connor. And there's people who would say, oh, well, maybe some of the features I use more often than others. Um, would be the person responsible and behind the scenes. You know, I might look at, at Benny or Drubba or some of these other names you'll see in the, the commit history for some of the bigger features. Um, but after all of that kind of settled and there was a, a working product that people were using to swap assets, uh, you've got Justin that came out, just kind of a trader that came over to Avalanche for some of the interest in the tech and uh, just started gathering people together. Um, so there, you know, the Discord was formed, there was a Telegram, and uh, he started reaching out to folks who had been making contributions uh, just kind of on their free time as a, as a hobby. So we had devs, we had people in the community, people on socials, people in DevOps that would just kind of pop out, saw things that they could do better and, and helped out. Um, and so we kind of started bringing those people closer together to the point where we called it a, a core team. Um, and eventually that core team was, was hired by the greater community through their governance system. Um, so some people might even say that the, the owner of Pangolin is that governance contract. They wouldn't be wrong either. But there's a lot of people that come together. I think if you want a, a specific name for that, um, I think you would have got Justin who's leading most of the, the horses out here. Uh, but those horses are doing their own things as well. Yeah, awesome answer, Brandon. Can, if, if I can just add a little bit like from my... Uh... Um, relative experience, I guess, is like, and, and Brennan nailed it, like, w there's no one in, I mean, so, so let's talk about what a DAO is, it's a decentralized autonomous organization. So in traditional businesses, it's a hierarchical organization. So there's some, some people that sit on the top, and you know, they make all the kind of decisions and everything flows down. A, a, a DAO aims to be different. It, it like, I mean, sometimes people you know that, that, that like Uniswap call themselves a DAO, but that's bollocks. Like it's it, it's not. It's a bunch of VCs controlling everything. You know, Pangolin is really a community, and 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 
you know, from my personal, and this is just me, is in a traditional organization, the goal is to make yourself indispensable. You know, in a DAO, it's to make yourself obsolete. So it should never be reliant on one person. It should it should organically be able to operate. So there's no one in charge. It, it, it's everyone does li little bits here and there, and they focus on different things that, that they're good at and that they specialize in. But but there's no one in charge. Like uh, uh, and if someone thinks they're in charge, I, I, I'd encourage the community to pull them down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are great answers. I, I think what separates uh, what sets Pangolin apart from other DEXs, other projects, is the decentralized nature, the community focus. Um, you know, decisions aren't made behind closed doors and not communicated. Everything's very transparent. Uh, we get feedback from the community. We vote. It's a, it's a really cool model to see. So good question, and, and thanks for the answers, guys. And at times, there might be some stuff that sounds kind of frustrating when you might ask a question and get the answer of, you know, something, something, but I can't talk about it. And, you know, if we had our way, particularly myself, I'd spill everything. Uh, but as, as I'm in the, the team here is kind of finding out, uh, there's some legal obligations to people that you're working with, um, where they will come after you at the varying capacities for leaking information like that before the agreed terms. So when we get around stuff like that, it's kind of ask that you, you bear with us that, Whatever I can tell you, I definitely will. I think that goes across the board. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. And yeah, Brandon is a huge advocate of, you know, decentralization, transparency. We're really lucky to have him as our lead developer. It's a good question. All right. So time check. We're about 30 minutes in. Uh, you know, let's go for, what, 45 minutes, an hour, or whenever the questions stop trickling in. We've got a couple more on the board right now. So the next one is um, based on the response of impending DEX technology and Pangolin being the leading DEX, uh, would Pangolin then be able to incorporate any of these revolutionary DEX technologies? And that's an interesting question. I, I imagine he's, you know, you're referring to like the Uniswap V3 and maybe like a Bancor, IL protection, you know, things like that that are pushing the limits. Uh, what, do, what do you guys think, Brandon and, and Justin? Yes, it's, it's interesting. I'd be extremely interested in the, the new tech side of that. That would be like a, you know, a different consensus model or a, you know, blockchains invented all over again. Um, in the, the two examples you mentioned with the, the Uniswap V3 model, that's really just an idea that was incorporated into software. And I don't think Uniswap was actually the first to have that idea, but they were the first to make that popularized into the V3 model with the uh, different buckets of liquidity being linked together. So we've got a talented team here. Um, I think there's, there's no shortage of talent. And as these ideas kind of bubble up, you, you attack them to see what's feasible and what's not, and you go for it. So we're in this phase of the, the roadmap right now where we're trying to keep Pangolin in, in a good state and knock out some of the things specifically mentioned. Um, and then after that, there's that Pangolin V2 that gets quoted so much, who wants to do a, a V2. Uh, but I think that V2 is where we can really redesign some core concepts of Pangolin to come after something that would be more innovative, that would, I guess in the way you put it, um, would be some novel concepts, some new tech. Yeah, yeah, that's a great answer. Um, you know, we inherited Pangolin, and there's a lot of updates and foundational pieces that we like to make before we push the boundaries into our V2 roadmap, like Brandon said. Um, so, you know, these ideas, you know, um, DeFi is all open source. We can borrow ideas. We can write new ideas. It's, it's really a cool place to be because of how fast you can iterate and build in DeFi. It's a good question. Hopefully that answered uh, what you were asking. And if it didn't, just, you know, uh, you can ask some follow-up questions as well. Okay, so this next question is around um, the snapshot voting versus universal criteria. And I'm really excited about this question. 
to give some context, um, there's been discussion that you know, voting for new pairs has been getting too cumbersome. We're not getting enough engagement, especially since now that we're ramping up our pace, we need to submit multiple proposals per week, potentially. So the alternative is we could just vote instead on universal criteria or parameters where if a token or project meets these parameters, the team will just add them as a rewarded pair because the criteria were voted on already. Um, and so the question is, you know, what are the what are the team's thoughts around the preference between the two options? And what are the next steps? What do you guys think, Brandon and Justin? Yeah, this is something that's been tossed around for a little while. Kind of that uh, the two sides of the spectrum between, you know, is completely owned by a diverse community versus agility to implement stuff. Um, I think it was raised, uh, I want to say like two or three days ago in Telegram, there was a discussion going on uh, about this exact idea of taking uh, criteria to say, hey, if someone comes up and they meet these, you know, quantifiable pieces of evidence, that's enough to get in there and start the process going. Um, and that would kind of save three to four days of this initial uh, feeling out voting process. Um, and of course, it wouldn't exclude that from happening if something didn't meet this criteria, but still could accumulate enough PNG to make that proposal, that would still go through just the same. Um, but I like having a process there with some very defined terms to push things through. Um, I also saw, I think it was this morning or so, it seems Trader Joe's going down a, a similar approach. Um, so we'll have kind of more examples of how this plays out over there too. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And what about you, uh, Justin? Any thoughts around this? Yeah, I think, I mean, governance is a platform, right? Um, I think, you, 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 you know, there's, the hard part is defining what we should vote on. Um, like, I think we all agree everyone should have a vote, but you also want to make sure that the people that are voting um, understand the consequences of those votes. So in that regard, you know, I, like, I really like having um, tools. So if you're voting on this, what does that then happen or what occurs then? And that way people can actually understand the ramifications of the voting. Um, you, you, you know, like it gets a little bit idealistic and um, philosophical pretty quickly. Um, you know, like I always look at the Brexit situation um, and a lot of people voted for Britain to leave Europe um, uh, without really understanding what, what, what that meant and the reality. So I think having an informed uh, vote uh, is very important. So we have to provide tools so that the community can make the decisions that best suit and best serve the community. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good perspective too. Um, you know, from my perspective, it, rewards pairs, voting on rewards pairs is pretty unique to Pangolin. If you look at the other DEXs on Avalanche, you look at Trader Joe, you know, Canary, Lydia, they, they don't vote on their rewards pairs. It's kind of strategic by the team. If you look at Sushi Swap, Pancake Swap, the big DEXs out there leading the space, they don't vote on their rewards pairs. Um, so we're unique because we do want to push decentralization here, but I think we're starting to realize just the overhead of voting on rewards pairs is a lot for both the team, you know, and the community, especially since some of our community, they don't check in weekly or if they miss a week, you know, they don't want to be missing multiple votes there. Right. Um, so I do think, you know, moving towards a more streamlined model is going to help the team, the community, and particularly these new projects that are trying to get into the space, get liquidity, get PNG rewards. You know, everyone is coming to build on Avalanche, and the faster that we can you know, help get them up and running, uh, the quicker we can grow this space. So I think it's a really good idea. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to discuss what the right parameters are. But to get this way more streamlined is going to help everyone. Um, uh, Penguin's been live for six months, and there's only been three new pairs added in six months. Uh, it's been what Snowball, Verso, and Spore, and that pace is pretty slow. If we want to move quickly, 
uh, in this in this fast environment. So that's I, I think it was a really good su suggestion from the community to move to this model. I'd love to try it out. So great question, and uh, appreciate hearing everyone's thoughts on the team around this. Okay, so yeah, the next steps would be to, you know, let's talk about this in Telegram in governance. Let's get our parameters right, and then let's vote on if we should move to this model. Cool, so let's move on to another question. So the question is, um, it's unfortunate that some projects remain halfway because developers abandoned the concept because they didn't achieve the desired capitalization in the long term. How do you plan to make this project sustainable for its development? What do you guys think? Yeah, I might jump in on this one. Um, yeah, I mean, I view Pangolin like a stock. Um, so I, I, I see the treasury almost as VC capital, right? So when you look at a when you look at a startup, what what happens with them is they go to VCs and they get funded, and then they get a few years to build their product. And then they're expected to be profitable after a certain amount of time, right? Um, so that's kind of like us, right? So, so we have to provide an ability for our revenue to cover our operating expenses. So if that happens, well, then we can operate in perpetuity, right? So like, let's say for, so if you look at that finance post I wrote in, at our current burn rate, so burn rate is how much we spend in uh, per month and per year on operating expenditure. So things like salaries, things like marketing, uh, things like, you know, weird little things like, you know, licenses or uh, so, so software for AWS, all of those sorts of things that you need to run a project like this, right? So if you look at our current burn rate, we're looking at probably about 1.5 million a year at the moment. That's obviously going to increase as we start scaling up. Um, but ultimately then what you need is if you're thinking that you spend in 1.5 million a year, Eventually, what you're going to have to have is you're going to have to have enough revenue to cover those expenditures. So currently, our only revenue source is the swap fees, um, which currently all goes to liquidity providers. So Pangolin's not taking as a fix. Um, we're not taking any uh, revenue. We can turn that revenue fee on or that swap fee, uh, which we are talking about, and we're just finding the best way to do that, um, which, yeah. Um, and then the thing is, then you've got to look at diversifying revenue sources. So if volume is your only revenue source, that then puts you in a bit of a dangerous position. Uh, if, you know, as we've experienced, the market goes down or there's volatility um, and you, you, you bet all your horses on that one particular revenue source. So we have to look at both uh, our revenue sources, diversifying those revenue sources and increasing those revenue sources. So that revenue will always be able to pay for operating expenditure. Then Pangolin could operate for you know forty years, fifty years. It could really you, you, we could be creating a dynasty. Um, but it's important that we create a sustainable dynasty where our revenue does cover our costs. Yeah, yeah, that's a good answer and a good question. Do you want to touch on the uh, investing on the treasury as well, Justin? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, 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 so this one I know I know can get a little bit emotional uh, or controversial. So, I mean, it's, so most mature traditional businesses they diversify their treasury for risk. Uh, so currently, our treasury we've got about sixteen million pangolins. So I think it's about twenty million US dollars, right? So now it's not currently earning any interest. It's not doing anything. So it's it's kind of just dumb money. Um, so there's a few things. There's you, 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 you always want money working for you, right? You don't want money sitting there not earning interest. So that's the one thing. Uh, the other thing is how do you diversify risk? So you've got to diversify risk in different ways. You've got to first look at what your risk is. So you've got to say, well, does is Avalanche going to be the best or the, num the top blockchain? So do you diversify against Avalanche and do you then invest in other L1 solutions such as Ethereum? That's a question. I'm not proposing that that's what we do, but I'm saying when you analyze risk, you've got to ask these questions. Do you diversify against the whole crypto market? So if the market goes down, as we've seen it does, well, then theoretically you could lose a million dollars a day, right? So there's all these types of things that come into play with treasury management. 
uh, and it's a whole branch. So if we think about a, D, a DAO or decentralized autonomous organization, you'd almost have a working group that focuses on the treasury and their job would be to protect the treasury and to make sure that the treasury is actually making money because currently that, that money is not making money at all. Yeah, yeah, that's a great uh, answer and perspective. And um, just to kind of summarize, um, you know, this this project is community owned. It's it's owned by governance and by the treasury, by PNG holders. So, you know, even if this current team isn't the one doing the tr the job in two years, you know, it's not our project. It's the it's the community's project. You would just hire more contributors to do the work, right? So that's what's kind of beautiful about the Pangolin model. Cool. So let's move on to another one. A uh, quick time check. We're at 45 minutes in. You know, let's go for about an hour. That's how long we usually go for. All right. So the next one is from George. Don't you guys think that it'd be nice to reveal your full names and faces on this project is kind of concerning. Um, so I mean, just to say we, you know, we have posted our, our names, our faces, our LinkedIn's uh, everywhere, basically, mostly in the governance forum. We were initially applying for these jobs. Um, you know, one of the reasons I don't just blast my full name everywhere is to protect myself from phishing hacks. You know, as a high profile contributor with a public role, uh, you know, there's always people trying to impersonate me, trying to maybe get my personal information to log into my email and things like that. So, so I think there is some protection that comes with being very publicly anonymous. But you know, if you even dig just a little bit, like our names are on the website homepage. You know, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's not that hard to find out who we are. What do you guys think? Yeah, within a day of posting the the names and emails on that Penguin Exchange, I, I assume you were as well. I was getting blasted with spam almost immediately. There's uh, kind of bots fighting bots for the the first right to find those emails, scrape them, and and send them. Um, and on Telegram as well, like. There's there's people all over there trying to impersonate the the admins. Right? You ask a question and you know at least someone's going to DM you pretending to be somebody else. So there's risk with that you know happening in in a grander sense of real life as well. But I mean I'm I'm branded Mino. I'm not you know a non. If any of the team here is at this point, just don't go around blasting it. Yeah, a spot on with Brandon said like like my name's Justin Trollope like. You know, it's very easy to find me on LinkedIn on whatever. Just yeah, it's it, it's the only reason why we don't like actually carry Selden is really to have some pseudo anonymity because you know there's only so many sexual emails I can get in a week. Cool. So you know, good question, and it's definitely concern. Um, when, when teams are anonymous, I don't I don't fault them for it because it does add protection. But yeah, as an investor, as a user. Kind of want to do some research on a project and who's running it so good question cool so um let's see scrolling down to the next question this one is from crypto fish hey so crypto fish is one of the founders of trader joe it's doing very well right now they're another new decks on avalanche so crypto fish is asking uh you seem to hint at some big innovations subnets dark pools What's your track record in implementing such innovations and why should users put their faith in the team in delivering such features? Good question. What do you guys think? I'm, I'm happy taking this one. I mean, DeFi, it's only been around a year. So, I mean, like it's, it's really hard to say what is your track record when, um, you know, the advent of DeFi is so young, right? So, so we could argue that DeFi really started with Compound. Um, so, uh, you, you know, some of the biggest projects in the space, you could have said, what is your track record? And they would have said, well, we don't have a track record. We're literally forging new paths. Uh, and that's what DeFi is, right? Like we're, we're, we're at the start of a very nascent technology curve. Um, I'd argue that no one has a track record uh, barring um, some of the Ethereum OGs in the space, uh, which were definitely not those. Um, so yeah, I'd argue that's 
part of the, the awesome, exciting journey we're on. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, th th these are all new financial perimeters built on completely new technology. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I'll, I'll go first. So, I mean, I want to jump in and say, you know, although DeFi does have some different unique components, such as smart contracts and Web3, you know, all three of us, Brandon, Justin, and myself, have probably a decade or more of just building software, delivering on projects. You know, you work at a traditional software company and you're delivering five to 10 projects a year. And then you multiply that by 10 years and you've delivered dozens and dozens of features and projects. And you kind of know the ropes of red flags, what to watch out for when you're behind, when you need to add resources. So although, you know, specific DeFi concepts might be new to us, just the best practices of delivering safe and quality software is not new to us, right? And what were you going to add, Brandon? Yeah, I think it's almost a, a funny note that in you know ten plus years of traditional software development, the amount of times that I was asked what we could do that was innovative, like not even as an individual, but like as a team, that was very rarely on the table as something that was being reached for, and that, that's not the case in DeFi, which is part of why it's so enticing. You're kind of on the, the cutting edge of what's to come. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give Trader Joe, I, I believe uh, the question was from uh, Trader Joe Dev, right? Um, the, the cool thing I saw over there was the, uh, the doubly rewarded re um, farming pairs. So, you know, shout out to that's pretty cool. Uh, but at least on our side, if you're looking for specific things that aren't, you know, seen all over the, the ecosystem, you know, we just try and take whatever we're hearing from our users as one side of it, right? So there's innovation trying to solve problems like uh, whoever's coming in the front door and the innovations of creating new doors going forward. So on the first half, you know, we had people trying to vote and uh, it was it was becoming a nuisance with the, the PNG. You know, if you've got it and you're holding it, you're not utilizing it for some of its potential utilities. Um, and so one thing we tried to do, which I haven't seen very much, uh, if anywhere else, uh, was to take the underlying PNG that our liquidity represents, right? So if you're in a liquidity pool with PNG link, half of that is PNG that you still own. Um, and the, the current system we have on Snapchat allows you to utilize that PNG, which is a governance token, to vote in any sort of on-chain proposal or the off-chain stuff with the snapshot, uh, as well as some other places where if you're staking it, you're holding it, or even if you're, you've got pending PNG rewards. I mean, we're pushing fronts where we can, uh, just trying to solve as many problems and whatever the avenue is for that, if that's innovation, that's awesome. Good answer, yeah. And um, just also want to call out that, you know, Brandon and Justin have been looking at the Pangolin code since, you know, basically since Pangolin was around. So they're they're very familiar, you know, in terms of, People that know the Pangolin code base in the world, you know, they're top five, top 10 for sure, uh, even before they were hired, which is really impressive. So, uh, you know, I trust them, I trust their backgrounds, and we want to deliver great things. And if we don't know how to do it, you know, we're going to hire the help we need to build it. So, good question. And, go ahead. Oh, this, this is the negative side of things. Like, if it gets to a point where, you know, you're answering questions, you're asking questions, you're not getting answers you like. Like it is completely within the community kind of ownership to take this to the governance proposal, uh, the governance forum and propose the like the removal or the adding of an individual for the team. Um, like we're not above this. We're, we're here to kind of, because the community voted us to be here. And if that's not the case, there, there's avenues to do that. It's part of being a community owned DEX. Yeah, that's also true. If you want something else, you propose and vote for it. Very cool model. All right. Well, I appreciate that question, CryptoFish. And, you know, cool stuff you're doing at Trader Joe. Congrats on the launch of your app. Okay. Let's uh, do a time check. We've got about six minutes left. Probably time for one or two more questions. Here's a good one from MF. How much revenue will Swaps bring in? Who wants to take this one? Um, I mean, it's it, it, it's variable, right? So it, it, it works out of CGL, right? So 
it's very all based upon the price at that point in time. Um, so let's go look at the info. I'll do some very back of the paper maths here. Uh, so if I go into US dollars and we look at the volume, uh, you'd have to take total volume uh, and then times that by 0 0.05%. Um, yeah, so I don't know offhand. Uh, when I was calculating it a while ago, it came up to about 2 million a year uh, that we would earn. So currently, if we had a turn on that revenue fee, um, Pangolin would be able to be self-sufficient. We'd be able to run operating costs, um, but then that would exclude that swap fee from going to TNG holders. Um, so, you know, so I don't think we're there at that point where we can justify uh, taking the swap fees to pay operating expenditure, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a good, healthy place to be that swap revenue could cover OPEX. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we take 0.3% of each swap as a fee. All of that goes to LP providers right now. There is a switch to route 0.05% of that 0.3% to another effort, whether it be funding the treasury, uh, sharing through staking, like fee sharing. So we're kind of just uh, keeping that lever until we have the right idea for it. Good question. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take one more um, before we wrap up here. And the question is, so I find it very interesting the way of paying of Yield Yak. So I guess the way Yield Yak pays its contributors uh, it creates a very intelligent way of paying their staff without putting sell pressure on their token. Have you considered at some point moving to this model? Uh, is anyone familiar uh, with this model? So Yield Yak being an auto compounder is in a position to gather more assets than just one. I'm um, just a normal day-to-day -day operations of the protocol. Uh, the way Pangolin is currently situated, that's that's not the case. We've got a, uh, you know, PNG emissions are, are the main source of tokenomics right now. And one thing that we've kind of been talking about just recently in this AMA uh, was that fee switch, the the 005 percent of total trade volume. And something nifty that that would do is it would allow kind of a, a diversification of the holdings of Pangolin. Right, so you'd have PNG, but you also have a portion of all of the swapped assets with high volume. Right, so that would include Ethereum, that would include DAI, would include native assets like Snowball, Yieldjack if they release their token. Um, and that would put Penguin in a different situation where there's different options for the, those assets now. Whether those could be used to pay different salaries or bounties or, or something of that sort, or towards a staking implementation uh, where users could do that. And it could be uh, sold for PNG like a buyback, or it could be distributed just as the tokens themselves. Um, some other things that were raised up was just a, a direct diversification of the current PNG holdings in the treasury. Right, so we have I think it's 16 million PNG left over from uh, the unclaimed airdrop, and there's been ideas proposed and floating around about just directly diversifying that. Um, perhaps there's some sort of OTC trading, uh, so there's not a, a dump or there's not high slippage on that. Um, so there's different options, but like Yieldjack is positioned already in a way where it makes that very easy to do. And Pangolin has kind of some avenues to get there to a place where it would also be easy to do. Yeah, if I could jump in there, like, and, and, and Brennan uh, uh, mentioned a good point about the treasury diversification. Like, I really like, you know, where the strategists get paid, like Yearn, I think was the first one that introduced that. So if they introduced a strategy, they would take a percentage of that strategy. Um, you, you, you know, this doesn't really work in our current model, but if we had, for example, an ability for people to invent strategies that brought in further revenue, they could then have a cut. So one example of this is, let's say you diversify the treasury and you have what we call the Pangolin, um, I don't know, Pang Pangolin Ventures. And Pangolin supported other projects within the ecosystem in exchange for their, like a, some of their tokens, and that was profitable. Well, then whoever was in charge of helping that project or getting that project off the ground could then get a cut. I'm not 
saying we're going to do that, but you know, these are the types of things you can do that then ties performance back to uh, rewards. Cool. Yeah, good answers and good question. You know, Yield Yak is definitely pushing the envelope over there in terms of how they're structuring their projects. So very cool ideas coming from that team. OK, uh, I think we're about out of time. We're an hour in. So if you have any more questions, you can drop them in the chat, and we'll try to answer them later. But for now, we're going to wrap up. Appreciate everyone's questions and answers, and have a great day.